live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Welcome to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and joining me tonight is Kevin J. Hickerson, the new president of the Fairfax Education Association. And today is, in fact, his first day on the job. Welcome, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. I, I figured the first day, just jump right in. There we go. So you have actually come to this position after teaching 13 years at Chantilly High School. Yes. English teacher, special education. Yes. So describe a little bit how you ended up in this role. <laughs> uh, I ended up in the president's role. I was, I was serving on the uh, board of directors for 10 years. Um, actually, they asked me to be a building rep at my school. I jumped right in, and I've, I've loved it ever since. And because uh, I believe that when we're dealing with our employees, we also are dealing with our kids' lives. So making sure that they have the optimal working conditions, make sure they have the best learning conditions for, for students. Well, this is great. So you and I kind of ran into each other, and I said, come on and let's do a show. And, and I'm like, what do you want to talk about? Mm -hmm. And you said, I want to talk about community schools. Yes. And, and I didn't know anything about community schools. You know, full disclosure, <laughs> like, I'm like, okay, we'll talk about that, but I don't know really. L little, little did you know that you would be falling down the rabbit hole like Alice, and all of a yes. sudden it's exploding. And it's yes, but I was so, I ended up going to Net Netroots Nation in July, just a few weeks ago actually, and sitting in on a panel about community schools and was fascinated um, by the fact that it's not what I thought it was. I think a lot of people are thinking, are we talking about charter schools? This is absolutely diametrically on the opposite end of the spectrum Oh yeah, charter schools. Oh, definitely. It's, it's one of those things where people think that um, community schools and charter schools are synonymous, but they're, they're really not. Um, Charter schools are a top-down top driven model um, of the way to educate students and it's, it's basically usurping control over, over the school district. Um, while community schools are really about the community, they're from the ground up and they really are about um, fostering uh, roots and, and making sure that everybody is connected instead of uh, this top-down driven model. Right, so um, I can see that they put behind us on the screen that we have got a, a definition of what a community school is. Oh, yes. and, and I think that this is a pretty good definition. It comes from the Children's Aid Society of New York, one of the oldest children's organizations in New York City. Jane Quinn was at the Netroots Nation panel I was on. She mm -hmm. did wo a wonderful presentation about the 22 schools that are run by the Children's Aid Society in the Washington Heights area of New York. So this is kind of a fundamentally, that is a great definition starting out with a community school. Sure, and, and I mean, and, and the definition, as you can see up there, focuses on partnership. And you know, that's, that's what it really is all about, making sure that the community, the students, the, the teachers, the, the administration, um, you know, everybody has an, a, an investment into this school. And so a lot of these schools have started out in places where the schools are struggling. Clearly New York City had, had pockets where the schools are really struggling. I was really impressed when and they um, gave the stats for Kentucky. Mm -hmm. The Kentucky has 1,000 community schools out of 1,033, and they went from 1998, they were ranked 48th, to being ranked 27th in 2016. To me, that is, that is evidence-based research on a model that says it works. Sure, and I mean, it's just not in Kentucky, it's in New York City, it's in Cincinnati, Ohio, it's in Los Angeles. It's everywhere, it's in 5,000 schools across the country, and each of those schools um, are, are not the same. You know, they all have different needs. And what we've found is that uh, these community schools are, are, are really individual. Um, and I, I mentioned to you earlier, it's like, it's kind of like having your cell phone. You know, you, you, you bring your cell phone out, we have, we have the same cell phone, but that's what's on the outside. What's on the inside are different apps. I don't know if you have Pokemon Go or anything, but I no, don't. I don't. <laughs> I don't either. But but there's others that do because that suits their interests. That suits their needs. It's the same thing with the community school. It's it's finding uh, you know different areas in which a community really needs an, uh, uh, something, uh, whether it's um, you know the wraparound services of healthcare, you know making sure that they have good lunches, an after school program, whatever it is. It's custom tailored for those schools. Yeah, and I think each community because of the the makeup of the families and the students. And one of the things that interests me about the community schools is how involving the parents is one of the key components to making the schools work. And a lot of times, I don't think people understand that lack of parent involvement is sometimes because the parents don't perceive that they're welcome there. Sure. And that's one of the things as a teacher, you know, we we often as teachers want our, our parents more involved. And, 
sometimes we lament the fact that they're not more involved and we're always questioning like what can we do to get them more involved well if you give them a mechanism in which to um, belong to a, a school and, and they feel welcome it's just not about like a, a PTA group or, or joining the you know a bake sale or something like that it's actually getting involved talking to the teachers helping to make decisions in in their school yeah one of the schools they were talking about and I think it's one of the ones in Washington Heights New York they were talking about the fact that on any, any given morning every morning they have a meeting that parents are invited to at the start of the school day and on any given morning you can find 40 parents there and, and all of that and all of that kind of helps to support the goals of the school in other words community school really does mean the whole community sure that, and, and, I'm, and I'm not trying to, you know, bash the things that we do in, in Fairfax County, but, you know, I have back-to-school nights that sometimes don't even get 40 parents participating in five classes. So, you know, it's, it's the thing of, you know, what, what do the parents really want? And we, we as a school community should be responding to what their, what their needs are. You know, and I think I had talked earlier, I did an earlier show on the school-to-prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. One of the keys to the model for the community school is restorative justice. Can you explain a little bit about restorative? Justice. Sure. Restorative justice is making sure that um, our students are, are having the opportunity to, um, you know, get past their mistakes. Right. You know, I mean, it's it's one of these things where we were talking a few years ago about um, uh, a, a, a no tolerance policy. Zero tolerance Zero, policy. Yeah. And. Yep. and and to, to us as, a, as an educator, that's, we all make mistakes. And you know, restorative justice allows for mistakes to happen, for, for kids to learn, and to, instead of going to uh, you know, the school, in, like you said, the school the to prison. Office, like, yeah, yeah, the pr resource office, yeah. Or the resource right. office. Um, you know, we instead offer some steps to you know, change behavior and, and try to correct it before it gets to any you know, real hard discipline. And I think that makes sense too. One of the things that they talked about is that you know the zero tolerance policy has truly fed the school to prison pipeline, mm -hmm. and that uh, and I forget who on the panel said it, but there should be a zero indifference policy. Yeah. You know, you can have zero tolerance for people being bullied, or you can have zero tolerance for disruption, but you sh you should recognize that when those things happen, that it can't just be about punishment. Sure. You know, and there's and they talked also about this model that we have of a it's a test and punish model. Sure. And some people and some people might see that as being soft and being lax on on students, but it's it's really not. It's it's really seeing them as human beings that they're that they're young that they're growing up. Now we're not talking about you know if, if, if a student gets into a fight or something that you know there's got to be some consequences for that but you know when we're talking about um, you know behaviors I didn't write a, I didn't write a discipline referral in 10 years and one of the reasons was the classroom management skills and and seeing the students as little they're human they're beings. children they're children they're children and, and I remember when I was a child and you know I had you know you know crazy thoughts and you know it, I would say things that were just not right for for the classroom and you know if I had a zero tolerance policy for every time that you know something like that was done I would not be in the position I am right now and that's and that's what we're talking about Juliet Hisne I think who's an attorney mm -hmm. and she talked with me about the school to prison pipeline put it best when she said we are criminalizing childhood behaviors when a nine-year-old in a Lynchburg elementary school ends up you know being charged for kicking a trash can in his in his classroom to me the onus is not on the child it's on the system that produced a referral to the juvenile justice system. Sure, and and that's one of the things we need to work with. And I think I think Fairfax County is you know definitely has taken steps towards you know reducing and and and, and overturning that. I think they I think they saw that it wasn't necessarily working, and you know we saw it with different examples um, and some high profile examples. Um, but you know it, the, the Fairfax County I think has taken a look at the SRNR and has reformed it in a way that I think. You know, makes makes things better. So let's talk about you know Fairfax is a big county. Oh, I mean, it's an huge. affluent county. We talk about a lot all the time. One of the you know the richest counties in the country, certainly in Virginia. And yet there are pockets where we have struggling communities, mm -hmm. very poor communities, mm -hmm. um, and those schools you cannot lump all of Fairfax County public schools into one basket and say that what is going to work well in one place is going to work in another. And and I think that is based on the communities that they are in. Sure. And I mean, as as um, you know, as before I was in my role as president of the Fairfax Education Association, you know, through my various roles in 
in FEA, um, you know, I would go across the county and you would, you would be amazed to see that some people in one community go, oh, everything's just fine in Fairfax County. And then you would go in another one and there's, you know, uh, gym equipment that's breaking down. You know, the, the playground is a mess. And, you know, and you look around and you go, why would I send, want to send my kid here? And, and I would understand a parent having that question. So no, you can't lump, uh, you know, Fairfax County all in one. You know, areas are, are different, and that's okay. We have to we have to embrace the diversity of our county. I think more and more, you know, I work sit on the. Uh the board of Bright Pass, which used to be our daily bread, and we do a school backpack program. I think there's a lot of nonprofits who do a school mm -hmm. backpack program that acknowledges there are students returning to school in the fall that they can't afford pencils and paper and, and sure. notebooks and things. You know, the First Lady of Virginia, Dorothy McCullough, has been very focused on, on childhood nutrition, acknowledging the fact that there are kids who go to school hungry. You know, um, we have more and more schools that provide free lunches. Mm -hmm. Some are providing breakfast and lunch. But this is part of what the community schools are also acknowledging is that you, you know, you can't learn in a classroom if you're hungry. Okay. You know, you can't, if you're, if you're not, if you come to class without a pencil, this was a great example that they gave in this panel. Mm -hmm. You know, if you keep punishing a child and escalating a child who has not brought a pencil to class for the third day in the row, instead of asking why the child doesn't have a pencil. Sure can't afford a pencil, right. somebody stole your pencil on the playground, why don't you, have, no. This is part of the what we're seeing about the whole punishment model. Sure. And, and you know, I have I had a couple students in, in my class, I'll bring one example up, where I had a student who was pregnant, and she she had spotty attendance, and, you know, there was sometimes that she would turn in great work, and there were sometimes that she was like, I didn't want to, I don't want to turn anything in. You know, she's pregnant. She's right. got a lot of, she's got a lot of things going on. Right. Um, and one of the things that I found out that she wasn't eating breakfast. And so one of the things that I did was I bought her breakfast every single day, and I, and I bought snacks, and I put them in a cabinet, and I said, that's your cabinet, you go and get it. That's the type of community that we need. We need people to take care of our students and, and, and just in, embrace them individually. And that's what a community model is. And that's, that's one of the things that I love about the community schools is that we're able to do that. We're, it, I was doing it on an individual basis, but let's do it as a, a more holistic across the school. I think that's great. And I love that example that you just gave. So when we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about the ways in which we can incorporate these community school models into our Fairfax County public school system. So please join us after the break and we'll talk a little bit more to Kevin, who is the incoming president of the Fairfax Education Association, and he is here on his very first day. So please join us. Osama bin Laden calls getting nuclear weapons a religious duty. Today, materials that can be used to make nuclear weapons are stored in more than 40 countries. Sometimes protected by just a chain link fence. Yet not enough is being done to lock down these materials before terrorists steal them. Why did we learn all this? My mother. My son. My sister-in-law. Were all murdered September 11th. Help protect America. Together we can. Please join us. The stem cell issue is being debated throughout the country. Truth is, most everyone has an opinion, even if they don't know the facts. Let's stop arguing and start really understanding the potential of stem cell research. For us and for millions of Americans living with disabilities, get the facts. Call 1-877-842-3442 for free information from the Stem Cell Research Foundation. That's 1-877-842-3442. Following the tragic events of September 11th, there have been hundreds of violent attacks against innocent Americans. Remember what that flag you're waving stands for. Remember, please stop the hate. We're stronger when we are united. Remember. Remember what that flag you're waving stands for. One nation under God. Indivisible. With liberty. And justice. For all. In America, there's either room for everyone or it's not America. Don't pick the wrong fight. Let's keep America land of the free. Stop the hate. Planning a home renovation? Put this at the top of your to-do list. Because after 10 years, none of you are protected against tetanus and another potentially fatal disease, diphtheria. A minor injury, such as a cut or a scrape, can put you at risk for a tetanus infection. And while Safety Gear offers some protection, an up-to-date vaccination called the TD Booster is the best insurance against tetanus. So get the TD Booster. If it's been 10, do it again. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. 
Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed. Joining me tonight on his first day as president of the Fairfax Education Association is Kevin Hickerson. So welcome, Kevin. Thank you. We're going to kind of help educate people on what the community schools are and how they're different. And so one of the things we're going to talk about is the development developmental triangle and the different mm -hmm. components of this developmental triangle, including the core instructional program, the comprehensive support services, and the expanded learning opportunities. So one of the big things that people always focus on, and I, I think it's I think it has merit, is the instructional program. You know, they're they're like if you have a good instructional program, everything else will take care of itself. Well, we're finding that that's not, not actually true. the case at all. Um, you can have a great instructional program, but if you find that kids are not, you know, they're hungry, they're, they're, they can't get a ride to school, whatever it is, um, they're not going to learn. You can right. have the greatest, you can have the greatest instructional program ever. They're just not going to learn. So, what the other two sides of the triangle do is that they they have the expanded learning opportunities, um, and we're not necessarily talking about um, extending the school day per right. se. Um, we're talking about giving enrichment opportunities after school uh, for students who want to take advantage of them to be able to close that that gap that we right. have the instructional gap that we have um, and this is why it's important for um, you know for it to be a bottom up type of, of deal and the reason why is that you have to have buy-in from your instructional staff you can't just place this on a school and say you all have a community stool go ahead that's it um, because you're going to get staff that are like, wait, I didn't sign up for to host an additional three or four hours of after-school activities, um, or you know, oh, one day I I can't make it to this after-school activity. Can you cover for me? You know, you have to have staff buy-in, and staff has to be able to be there um, to make this program work with the expanded learning opportunities, and then of course, the comprehensive support services. Um, we're not just we're, we're not just talking about uh, making sure. Uh, uh, kids have a good meal because they, they, right. they need that um, and, and they get that with a you know if you have a free and reduced lunch student they're getting a breakfast they're getting a lunch but making sure that there are other things that are happening at this uh, on the school campus such as uh, health care um, you know instead of a student having to go get vaccinated you know if they need a booster shot or whatever um, instead of taking a day off and the parents having to take a right. day off and sitting in a public health clinic or wherever you sure. get your medical care sure and you have them coming to they, they, they come to the school and take care of it and you have some schools that have models of um, where the whole community can get their health care services there yes or or, or or not but 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 you that have was some that surprised me but yeah. yeah that truly is a community school where you're taking care of the students and mm -hmm. you're taking care of the family members sure. of the students and that might be getting a child a pair of glasses it mm -hmm. might be mental health services sure one of the shocking things that came out of a panel that I sat in on Netroots Nation is that 1.5 million students are in schools with resource officers and no counselors. Wow. Yeah, I did, I stunning, didn't know that that's a, that's stunning, 1.5 million, no counselors. So at the very least, if you can put a, a law enforcement officer in the hallway of a school, but you cannot afford to have a guidance counselor, that, that says something right there about where the priorities are. Sure, I mean, it, it, we, we're, we're not concentrating on academics at that point at all. We're not count, uh, counting on their mental health. Um, we're not looking at, you know, what, like you said, what's going on in the classroom, you know, having somebody to actually probe those questions and, and, and put them out there. Um, no, but that's, that's part of the comprehensive support service is is an integral part you can't you can't have a community school without all three of these pillars um, you if you take one of these away the community school falls apart so you have to have all three of them and the thing is is that it doesn't always have to be um, you know, it doesn't always have to have money behind it. You can combine resources from the county. You can uh, ask community partners to come in. There are so many ways to bring in resources. It just doesn't always have to come from the school district itself. Right, and Fairfax County does a pretty good job of that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, again, I work for Bright Paths, formerly Our Daily Bread, and, you know, we provide services through the county. In other words, we get referrals from the county to provide sure. certain kinds of services. And there's other nonprofits that do the same. So actually weaving this, and actually the term that Jane Quinn from the Children's Aid Society used was braiding together services. Yes. Braiding together services. Fairfax County has a lot of services, but how do people access them? And if the school can be a point 
of accessing the service both through the county and through their nonprofit partners, then that is that is so holistic. You know, let's talk about the key program components sure. because the key program components of this too, I think, really help to illuminate what kinds of things we're talking about. Sure. I mean, we're talking about after school and summer enrichment. Basically, your your school is is open not not 24 hours a day, but it's open for a long time during right. the day, and it's open during the summer. And that doesn't necessarily mean it says that you know we're having them sit in desks from from you know eight o'clock to three o'clock. No, it's it's allowing um, students who are economically disadvantaged. It allows them to have same opportunities as their as their peers who who might be able to go to a summer camp or go to a museum. It allows them to not just passively be sitting in front of a TV, you know, watching uh, you know uh, whatever show the <laughs> Price is Right or whatever. But they but they but they're allowed to have some sort of enrichment. Um, you know, it gets parents involvement. It, it really it really brings them to the school. It, it, it it's 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 draw it's like drawing to a light, and and they see it and they and they want to get more involved. Um, adult education. You know, we have we have a parents who uh, speak a second. You know, speak, uh, English Speaking is not, a second language. Yeah, right. Eng English is not their their first language. Well, you know, when we get all the time, you know, I, 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 why why can't you know the, the those parents uh, adopt English? Well, maybe they don't have the the opportunity to do or so. The resources. Or the or resources. Know, or know where to find those kinds of instructional environments. Exactly. Well, a community school is there, you know, and and to me, it's it, that's that's the opportunity right there um, to to get integrated more in, in the community that they're involved with. Um, of course, like med medical, dental, mental health services. I mean, we're we're talking about the county, um, you know, providing a lot of these resources. Well, you get more bang for your buck if you get more people involved in, right. to to use them. Um, so um, I, I think that th that opportunity is is right there. And of course, early childhood. Uh, you know, my daughter is a uh, special needs student, and she gets support through Fairfax County uh, Public Schools with an IEP. And the, the great thing is, is I, I know about some of these early childhood programs, and they're so great. They, they, you know, you have caring teachers who want to, you know, teach our students, you know, what they need to know. And it, uh, you know, our uh, vice presidential candidate, uh, the Democratic Tim Kaine, Tim Kaine yes. one of his big things is the pre-K initiatives. It absolutely is. There are more and more people who are coming out and saying that most of our our, our issues, community mm -hmm. issues, would be solved if we put more money into early learning and early childhood education. But even beyond what we think of as education, early childhood learning starts when kids go into daycare. Mm -hmm. You know, you have two parent families that work, and you put your child into a child care environment, whether it's home based or it's facility based. It's, sure. But these things are where we really need to be putting some resources and some dollars and some real research about how to get these kids launched into their academic career sure. better. No, and 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 exactly, and it will take. It does take more resources in in that sense, but you know. I think it's money well spent. You know, it, where we would we rather have uh, spend a little bit more money in the in the front end rather than the back end, which we're remedial. talking about what, remedial, right. or as we were talking about earlier, the school to prison pipeline. pipeline. You yep. know, the, the prisons cost more than the early education. So when we're talking about it's 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 a real paradigm shift. It's a, it's a paradigm shift in the way we think about how. You know, learning happens. We learn a lot more as as youngsters than we do when we're in Older, high school. Right. You know, in high school, I'm really trying to make sure that they have good enough skills. But the foundation, the the base, is is uh, early childhood and elementary school. And so some of these, after, so summer programs, because I had a community lodgings on the last show I did, and they have a after school program in Alexandria, where they give the kids access to computers and help with homework and mm -hmm. tutoring. So basically, this nonprofit is providing some of the things that a community school could provide, including access to computers, teaching kids. An another one I think would be very important is teaching kids to code. Sure. And some of those skills that, you know, more affluent kids in the summertime are sent away to space camp or they're, you know, sent to these camps where they get these enrichment programs. Mm -hmm. But kids who are stuck at home watching television because they don't have the ability to take advantage of these programs, 
this is where community schools really are investing the best resources in the people who need them the most. Sure, and and I agree. And it's not taking anything away from the nonprofits that are doing great work. There, you this know, is more efficient. Sure, and it's more efficient. And and sometimes I think they're they're overburdened with probably some of the requests that they get. It's the same thing that we have um, in this county with uh, the SAC program when we're talking about um, you know finding uh, after school care for for our students. Um, you know we have, the county runs the SAC program and you know they're 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 overburdened. You know, there's sometimes people people on the waiting list for years and years. I and know years. my kids were in SAC, so I know it very well. <laughs> and for working parents, and right. especially for single working parents, mm -hmm. SAC is a godsend. And your kids are getting some kind of enrichment program. They're not just latchkey kids at home in front sure. of the television set. Let's talk about several well-known models. Um, we have a slide on that. Several well-known models, uh, beacons, bridge to success. What do you know about some of these things? Well, I know that Children Aid Society um, Community Schools is, is primarily based out of New York City. Right. Um, and they, uh, I'm forgetting the number, number spacing on me, but um, they have a lot of schools. 22. In, 22. In, yeah, they're based in Washington okay. Heights and it's 22 schools. Thank you. Um, but, their their program model is is one of making sure that you know the students are well taken care of inside the school um, and during the day, and that they have some after school programs that really help out um, in the in the evening. What really impressed me, what mm -hmm. Jane Quinn said from the Children's Aid Society, is that these 22 schools in the community have actually created jobs for the community related to the services provided in the schools. It was a win-win all the way around for just the area that the schools are in, the families that live there, some of the adults that you know are looking for opportunities to invest in the community. Sure. Very impressive model. Well, and, and that's and that's exactly the point. I mean, when you're investing in the community, the community invests back into you. And um, to me, you have uh, you know you have opportunities to be able to take on a mentoring program or to be able to take on um, an after school uh, activity like a basketball or a you know a youth football league or whatever it is. Um, and those are uh, those are life skills that can be learned in those, but it, you're right, the jobs created from that, you know, invest the money right back into the community. Right, and, 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 and I'll go back to what you said from the very beginning, which is you have to bubble up from the bottom. This is not an ideology forced on a school like this is what we're doing now. This is a community saying these are the challenges of our students and their families. These are the challenges of our community, whatever they are. And the school is going to be front and center in helping to braid together resources that serve students, mm -hmm. serve their families, serve the educational goals of the school. You know, until you said something to me about community schools, I had no idea this existed, and yet there are 5,000 of right. them in this country. Well, I mean, I, the obvious need of, of changing the way that education is done in this country is there. Right. Um, it's about doing it in a smart manner, and community schools are that. Well, when we come back, and please join us, we'll come back in a few minutes to talk with Kevin Hickerson. A little more about the community schools. One of the things we're going to talk about is how they are different from charter schools. So please join us when we get back from this break. This is firstgov.gov, where we're obsessed with getting you government information. Brand new student loan applications on the site, baby. This calls for a celebration. So in the end, it was either take the astronaut gig or come work here. What can I say? Duty called. Dude, that's my cop. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I'm pretty sure that's Sam's cop. Oh, sorry? Yeah. No. Sam's? No. Just log on or email us and get what you need. C, change of address form. That's how it's done. D, driver's license renewal. Oh. E, uh, e. Uh, emailing social security information. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. We'll allow it. Mm. All right. Ed. What are those? Government surplus cars for auction. You posted those online last time. No, you did. I'm posting them online this time. For all your government information, firstgov.gov. Oh, what have we got here? Sometimes you feel tired. You can't seem to lose those extra pounds off your midsection. And your joints hurt when you take the stairs. Well, you're getting older. But I'm happy to say that there's some simple things we can do to keep you happy and healthy for years to come. We can also lower your risk for some serious diseases the older population is often subject to. Proper nutrition is more important than ever. Your body has changed, you know. Not as many treats. 
a basic exercise plan, lots of walks and fresh air, and most importantly, come and see me for twice yearly checkups to help ensure the best possible quality of life. Now, how does that sound? <laughs> Good boy. Improve the quality of life for your elderly pet. Schedule twice yearly checkups that include preventive care and regular lab work. A message from the veterinary members of the American Animal Hospital Association. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and we're here tonight with Kevin Hickerson on his first day as president of the Fairfax, Fairfax Education Association. Welcome back, Kevin. Thank you. So at our last break, we said that we were going to hit the difference between charter schools and community schools. On its face, there might be people who think, well, aren't they just private schools? And the answer is no. No. They're, no, they're, and that's the thing. That, that's actually a thing that educators get confused too. That you know they're talking about uh, pri there are private charters and there are public charters, um, and it's not to say that charter schools, all charter schools, are bad. But, right. But there are charter schools that are taking money from a public school system and they're coming up with uh, just the same results or so, in most cases even worse results. Right, they're a D and F rated charter school. Sure, and and the thing is is that when the charter schools are about mostly about a profit motive, um, you know, when you have competing interests about profit versus the children, uh, with the shareholders, the profit's going to win out mostly in the long run. Right, and that's one of the things they talked about this this panel that K through 12 Inc, which is like the largest for-profit company that runs these charter schools is publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange, which came, which blew my mind. Right. Like you are outsourcing education to a company that has to deliver a profit to its shareholders. How does that work? Well, I, I mean, the, the way they deliver their profit is by privatizing most of their staff. You know, when you're talking about bus drivers, custodians, we're talking about the cafeteria workers. Um, you know, each of these each of these people, by the way, which are just as integral as a teacher teacher because they're, they touch the students. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, 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 yeah. I mean, they're they're there. If I don't have a bus driver that can deliver a student, I don't have anybody to teach. If my my student isn't getting a warm meal, they're not going to be learning well. And if my if my classroom is not clean, then they don't have a good environment in which to work. With. So, in, in, in talking with a, um, a friend of mine mm -hmm. uh, who works in Georgia in Murray County Public Schools, mm -hmm. and we were, I was talking about how a suggestion had been made that we should privatize our bus fleet here in Fairfax County. And Judy, who is the principal of an elementary school in Murray County, said, that's what Georgia decided to do. And so they privatized their buses, their custodial t staff, and their cafeteria workers. And not only do those people not report to the school system who does not have, they don't have oversight, but she said the way they cut costs is they have no benefits. So let's talk about these trade-offs. So how you're saving money is let's privatize something where how the for-profit companies mm -hmm. now making money is you don't pay people a living wage and you strip away their benefits. Sure, and, I, and I'd like to say that Fairfax County Public Schools last year made sure that every employee in Fairfax County has a living wage. And that was one of the things that the Fairfax Education Association fought for. And the reason why is, is that you should be able to live in the community that you work in. And so, you know, it's we do have a, a good benefits package too with the, with the health insurance and dental, and and that's one of the big draws for for an employee. So if you're not giving those things, you know, you're going to have employees that are sick, that are, are right with no know, benefits. With How no does benefits? that help the community? And this is the, no, this brings us right back to where we started, which mm -hmm. is you cannot give short shrift to people in the community and think it does not impact the ecosystem of the community, whether it's bus drivers and cafeteria works and your, jan your janitorial staff, you know, some of these people do have children. And, you know, how does it help the school system to save on the one hand when you are robbing people who are then put in a, in a very desperate place on the other hand? Sure. And and I, I like to say that, you know, at Chantilly, where I, where I was working, um, one of the things that I love to do was I love to um, talk to my custodians every single day. I would, you know, they knew me as Mr. Kevin and, and I'd come down and I'd talk to them and, you know, I would find out about their struggles and what they were dealing with and and the cool thing is is that when I had my child they were the first to bring me you know diapers and and, and blankets and and I had a woman that dropped off uh, clothes every single day 
and I would do the same. I, you know, I had, yeah. I had a pregnant woman last year who was custodian, and the thing was is that we, we were a community ourselves, and, and that's why it was so tough to leave, but, but that's the whole point about a community school is getting back to it, is that we're all involved with each other. We all, it, we all are interested in each other's lives and making sure that everybody is, is doing all right. So we have had up to this point a lot of different things. We've had the no child left behind. Mm -hmm. We've had, you know, the core, curriculum and uh, now we've got um, every what is ESA? every student every student succeeds act the every student succeed, <laughs> succeeds act which is the new is thing right and they do have money to provide for community schools mm -hmm. the, the number I got at this panel was 2.4 billion dollars a year to provide resources for these community schools mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I think we need to talk about is the model of education and where it's come with all these different presidents and with all these different administrations and ideologically what we think like classroom instruction is the key to, to a good education which I think I'm understanding what I'm seeing is that we are kind of moving away from that seeing that isolated away from these other things that impact a child's life. Sure. Now, you know, a lot of people, and, and I'm one of them, will disparage No Child Left Behind. And it, it, it didn't do us a lot of favors, but what it did do was it put a microscope onto our communities to see where we were struggling. And if it, if it did one thing, it did that. Um, but you can, it, but it did it in a way that was just testing, 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 making kids sick, you know, to go to a test, making parents worry. Um, and everything, when you could just look at the um, economic indicators of a, of a community and you could pretty much tell what the test scores were gonna be for that community. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we have to do with uh, ESSA is we have to get it right. And I think there's a website. Uh, GetESARight.org. Yes. <laughs> yes, get it, ESSARight.org. And we have to get it right this time because we don't have another decade and a half to you know, spend see, on experimenting, right? Spend on experimenting, and you know that's what we've been doing a lot of in the last 15 years, and we we found that we were not effective in a lot of those implementations. But the community school in ESSA with with the Title IV funding is huge. It's a it's a huge investment into our communities, and I think I think we should be taking advantage of that. I, I think Fairfax County is ready. I think we're ready to go in. We could find some schools. We can get there, and we can get buy-in from those schools. I think Fairfax County is ready to see community schools here oh, in, I, within the next year. I I would agree with you. So let's talk about some of the newest research on that. You know, um, the inclusive leadership approach, the real family and community engagement, all of these things. The thing I like about this approach is it's not ideologically based. Mm -hmm. It is evidence based. Mm -hmm. With 5,000 schools currently operating, and not all of them are A schools, by the way. Mm -hmm. This panel was quick to point out that there are community schools that are also struggling to get it right. Mm -hmm. But where they've gotten it right, like in Kentucky, mm -hmm. they've gotten it extraordinarily right. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, there, there, are, there are countless um, examples of success for the community school model. And I, I, I mean, I, it does, it, the research shows that you have to have a principal that is really into it to be able to get their staff to, to get the buy-in. And that's what I was talking about earlier. Staff buy-in is crucial um, because what that does is allows for all of those wraparound services that we need. Um, the, real, the real family and community engagement, um, you know, that's that's in that's integral I mean they have to be there they have to have a they have to have some say in what's going on in the school they have to um, have a voice and if they and if they don't have that voice then it's it's really does it starts to feel that top-down model so again. let's talk about perception because a book I read recently mm -hmm. just it was a very good book it's called waking up white and it's about mm -hmm. it's a it's a book about racism okay but part of the book talked about how the school system assumed that parents weren't coming because they didn't care and were not engaged. And when they actually sat down and when you actually talk to minority parents, many of them feel unwelcome. So there is a gap between the perception of what motivates these parents and the reality of why they're not there. Sure. Yeah, when you're not taking when you're not taking into account what they have to say. I mean, I wouldn't feel welcome either. I, I mean, I could say something over and over again if somebody's not listening to me. I, if I feel ignored, I'm not gonna talk to that person anymore. So I, I have no reason to come back to you at that point. You know, and that's something, because we don't, as white people, generally talk about race very often, but uh, Jitu Brown, who mm -hmm. is 
came from the south side of Chicago, was part of a 34-day hunger strike to mm. keep yes. Diet High School open. Yes. You're right. So he was on this panel, and he was talking about the fact that in the south side of Chicago, you know, they have made great strides uh, in education with their community schools. But he said, you know, you look in the classrooms, and what you have are young white women just out of college in all of the classrooms in these predominantly black schools. Yeah, no, I, I, I do think that, um, you know, we do have to have uh uh, more resources, and I think I think that comes to, from from the bottom up again, from the schools to tell our tell our minority students that you know getting into education is a great right. Is, like, is, why is, don't is we thing. have more teachers that are from these minority communities? Sure. Why aren't they going into education to become teachers? Well, I mean, I think I think for over the years, education didn't work out well for them. So that why would they why would they become teachers? Um, but I do see the NEA um, is trying to you know push forward that we need more, you know, diversity, uh, diversity definitely in our, in diversity our, in the classroom. In the classroom. Um, it's one of the things that I've noticed. Um, and, you know, it's one of the things that I, I'd, I'd love to push for. Yeah, I think so, too, because because just like our court system and our General Assembly, our political spectrum, people want to see those who are making decisions or those in leadership roles be reflective of the people, whether it's in a classroom, mm -hmm. it's a courtroom, or it's a community. And at this point, we really don't have a pathway for a lot of these minorities to be represented in all of those places. Sure, no, and, and like, as I said before, if you're if you're talking and talking and talking and you're not being heard, then you're then you're going to go to the other direction. And you, know, you if you feel like you're being ignored, you're going to not go back to those people who are you're you know you're trying to make change with. So no, I, I definitely agree with you that there needs to be more diversity in our in our classrooms. And you know I, I think that there's there's organizations. Our organization uh, at, at the NEA level is is definitely working to making that happen. So the General Assembly Speaker Howe yes uh, last year mm -hmm. when the first day that the session was gaveled in talked about the priorities, which was kind of unusual for that legislative body or his party or whatever, and charter schools was mentioned. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, you know, to me that is stunning that somebody would stand up on a legislative floor and say that, that charter schools or, you know, solving our educational pro programs through this particular solution is going to be a priority. How do we push back against that? Well, I, you know, the Virginia Education Association was actually integral last year in stopping the constitutional amendment for charter schools uh, because it would have replaced local control of charter schools and given to the state institution, a panel that would have placed it, uh, a charter school in your community, whether you wanted it or not, and take the resources uh, away, away from, from the public school. Uh, away from the yep. public schools. And so um, I think w one way we push back that on in Virginia is you look at Virginia, there's only nine charter schools in the entire state. The reason why, the communities don't want them. The, the local school districts don't want them uh, in, in general. You know, the, I guess the nine were, were good enough to, to pass the muster. But in general, they, the communities don't want them. What they do want is they want real change. They don't want gimmicks. And, and that is what a, a community school is not a gimmick. It's, it's actually something that is real, has been tested, and is true throughout the nation. Well, I think that's some place where we need to do a little more discussion and we will, when we get back, talk yes. more about how community schools differ from the charter schools and the fact that some charter schools are showing results that are not necessarily accurate. So join us when we get back from the break and we'll talk again a little more with Kevin Hickerson. <laughs> okay. Too many women get hit by their boyfriends and husbands. Too many women are pressured into having unprotected sex. Half of the people in the world living with AIDS are women. It doesn't have to be this way. Together, we can change this reality. Let's strive for a world free of violence. At Volunteers of America, we don't just give kids a way to stay off the streets. We give them the tools they need to reach their full potential. We don't just help the elderly receive needed care. We help them live life to the fullest. We don't just provide food for homeless individuals and families. We provide job training and placement so they can buy groceries. Volunteers of America is a national organization that for over 100 years has provided programs and services that allow people to overcome their challenges 
to become vital members of their community. At Volunteers of America, we don't just help people, we help people help themselves. Find out how you can support the programs that are working in your community. Contact Volunteers of America today. Call 1-800-899-0089. Drivers face all kinds of distractions. Guys, 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 stop, stop playing, no? Before your wireless phone becomes one of them, stop. <laughs> Drive safely. Keep your phone in easy reach and dial sensibly. In bad weather or traffic, call later and use a hands-free device. Remember, with wireless, safety is your call. to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Catherine Reed, this is In Sky, Inside Scoop, and we're talking with Kevin Hickerson about the, his role now in the Fairfax Education Association and community schools. So when we left, we were talking about charter schools, and I wanted to bring up an example that was given at this panel at Netroots Nation about Urban Prep High School. And Urban Prep High School is a charter school, and their claim to fame is that 100% of the kids graduate from high school and 100% go to college. What they don't necessarily tell you is only 41% of those students ever make it past their freshman year. So to me, just because you can measure something doesn't mean that it's what we should be measuring. And so I turn to you and ask, yeah. what should we be measuring? Well, I mean, we should be measuring every single year the, you know, the growth between uh, what, what we have at the beginning of the year and the end of the year and seeing if what, what we're doing is, is making any sense, you know. Um, but the, the going, to, going to college is just one measure because not every kid is cut out for college, you know. Um, I, have a, I have a friend who owns a business who says he would, he would die for carpenters, he would die for a plumber. Welders, uh, right, welders carpenters, and, right. automotive mechanics. Right. And so, uh, you know, we, we've gotten this notion in in our society that college is the end all be all for our students because that's the pathway to success that's that's what everybody should strive for but we're really doing it on a educational system that was built in the early 20th century that was for the industrial revolution and in fact if you look at the way we graduate our students we graduate them with years you know they're like production line models of cars right. you know um, so so we're 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 in an industrial model but we're way past post industrial age we're in the computer technology age, you know, it's it's one of those things where we need to have a totally different way of thinking about our educational system. Right. So, uh, cybersecurity, because my son is in community college to get a certification in cybersecurity, because those jobs are going unfilled. Mm -hmm. So, you might have a four-year degree in something, but if you can't do this specific job with this specific skill set, then nobody wins. You don't have a job, and all of these companies who are, who are desperate for skilled mm -hmm. employees have no one to hire. Well, and that's that's, that's one of the things that we're, we're, we're learning right now, or actually the, that Virginia has taken on with ESSA, is we're changing the high school graduation requirements. Um, right now it takes um, six SOL classes uh, to be able to pass with a standard diploma and nine to pass with an advanced diploma. Um, and then we're also, but, but what they're doing is they're switching it to four SOLs. Um, one in English, one in math, one in science, and one teacher directed one in social studies. That's what they're looking to do. Um, and what this does is that it, it, it puts the focus back on making sure that the student as a whole is, is being taken care of. It's not just about a single test that they need to pass to be able to graduate. Um, in fact, I was hearing, I was listening to a speaker and he was talking about how in Virginia we, we have these advanced study diplomas and that um, right now only around 38% of our students that achieve an advanced studies diploma actually graduate within in the four year window in college. Um, so that's 38% success rate for four years. Um, to me, it's it, 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 what are we measuring? That, that degree, that high know. school diploma doesn't really do anything. I saw this, a, a research study by the Brookings Institution that talked about advanced placement classes and how they could not, they could not tie 
students taking advanced placement courses and getting college credit with them being any more successful in college or having any greater mastery of the subject matter in college than the kids who didn't take advanced placement. There's just, there's just no way to tie it together. We have in our mind this narrative or this belief system that this is how it, it works. And yet, if you really do the research and you look at the evidence, it's sometimes hard to tie these things together. Sure, and, the, and then the pressure grows on the students because the students are looking at other students taking all these advanced placement courses and getting the advanced degrees and they're they're going I need to do that I need to I, and there then, is a tremendous amount of pressure and, and you know it comes from the parents it comes from the school district it, it comes from various places but then there's that pressure you know it mentally hurts the kids you know and then they're not going to be performing their best um, and you know we, we have seen an uptick in, in mental uh, issues with our students and you know pressure from from our community to you know measure up to a certain standard in, in their in their diploma is is one of the things that we're seeing well we also it's, uh, someone also described on this panel that we have a test and punish model hmm. and that tests are the end all and be all and we want to find somebody to punish when the test scores aren't what they should be. Hmm. Everybody's looking for the scapegoat and the scapegoat they don't seem to think are poor students who don't have enough to eat or school supplies or their parents struggle with multiple jobs and don't make a living wage, they hmm. don't have affordable housing, they don't have transportation. For some reason we don't think any of that affects test scores. Yeah, it goes back again to that triangle. It goes back to you can't have a gr you, you can have the greatest instructional program ever but if you don't have the other two needs being met it's not well, and, and doesn't that needs. really kind of go back to a Maslow's hierarchy of need? <laughs> like, wasn't to me that is like the model of all of life. It's like I can pretty much tie everything in the universe back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Sure. If you don't meet the needs at the bottom, self-actualization is not ever going to happen. Well, I mean, you're you're not worried about that, are you? You're worried about what's happening in yeah. your life, right? Food, then and safety, there. housing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and you know, I think we've seen the effects. I mean, the effects of community schools in places like Kentucky. If we wanted to go to that. Yeah. Area. Let's look at the Kentucky the slide um, I think we've got that up no we don't have that Austin yeah the the community go. schools in Kentucky we do have that up and the fact that they went from 48th in 1998 to ranked 27th in 2016 1,000 schools in Kentucky are community schools out of 1,033 so mm -hmm. there's only got 33 schools that aren't community schools sure. I mean that's I mean the proof is in the pudding and I think the one of the important stats up there is there's only 1.4 percent difference um, uh, you know in terms of um, the low income students and other students that graduate on time um, to me that's that's closing that's the biggest gap. indicator yeah. is, is closing that gap as to the the, the the difference in the socioeconomic status of these students so I would say that the community schools just based on the evidence have figured out a way through this model to close the gap. In Kentucky, I mean, Virginia sees itself differently from a lot of other southern states, mm -hmm. and I think that's just how we see ourselves. It's like, well, we're Virginia. But sometimes, you know, what we do in Virginia is not necessarily all that forward thinking for a variety of different mm -hmm. reasons. But I would say what's happening in Kentucky clearly demonstrates, and and there are other places around the country too, but when they showed the map at this um, panel, I did not see any community schools in Virginia. Do we have any community schools in Virginia? Yeah, I'm. Because I did not see right, I, any dots on the map for us <laughs> having like any. Right, and and you know that's that's a good question, and that would be something that I have to look into. Um, you know, statewide, I didn't. I don't know if it. If I didn't see yeah. us on the map. Yeah, so if if you didn't see us on the map, then I'm pretty sure we're not on the map then. Yeah, <laughs> and so and I look at things, you know going back to the states that took Medicaid expansion too, mm -hmm. and Kentucky was one of the states that took Medicaid expansion. Sure. So there are some governments, there are some legislatures and leadership who understand that all of these things are tied together. A state that has a majority community schools and took Medicaid expansion is ranked 27th in the nation from for their schools. Well, I think this is a, this is a great opportunity for Fairfax to lead the charge in community schools. I think we could be one of the first ones out the gate in the Commonwealth of Virginia to be able to be, put our flag down and say we're we're building community schools. To the north of us, um, there were a couple of slides that they used, and I, we're going to look at the one from Austin, Texas, Reagan High School. But the Baltimore City Schools, mm -hmm. they have community schools in Baltimore that have achieved tremendous things, just as just as compelling as the the high school in Austin, Texas, has achieved in Baltimore. And again, I look at Virginia as kind of surrounded by other states that are well into looking at this model and implementing it and we seem to be lagging behind a little bit. Well, you know, I think it's 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 lack of recognition so far. You know, I think it's one of those things that people are starting to wake up to community schools. And um, you know, I think 
that you know if we if we presented this to the Virginia Department of Education you know as as a model I think they would take a look at it I think they would be I think they would be uh, I think open they would to open that? to the idea I think. so you were talking about the student mobility mm -hmm. explain what that mobility number is well in in Austin Texas the student mobility is you know where where the student starts and you know if they if they disappear from the school system they go to another school system um, whether it's because the parents have a job or you know or if they're they, they're being moved to another school district because they, they think there's another school that's better um, and if you notice that the student mobility in 2009 was 41% at uh, in Austin Texas it's 30% now um, you know parents are going to take their students where they think they can get the best educational opportunities a lot of time um, and so the, the the lowering of that mobility rate is 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 huge because as a teacher if if I'm seeing new students come in and seeing students leave my classroom I don't have any continuity within the classroom and you know that continuity again comes back to the community yeah and it, it you know my, my, my classroom is a small community and they all have Good days and bad days, but but the thing is, is that they, they're they're together, and mm -hmm. you know if, if we have kids that are moving out, it's a disruption, and that disruption leads to lower academic performance. And that leads to the whole concept of interdependency, mm -hmm. which all of us are inter interdependent, and yet we have we live in a culture where we really emphasize individuality mm -hmm. and individual achievement mm -hmm. and the rugged individualism, when in fact that really is counter to everything we know about how human beings thrive. Mm -hmm. So when I look at what has happened here in Austin, Texas, where they have doubled their enrollment, they have improved their graduation rate almost double. You know, this says something about what they were able to do to create a community of interdependence that resonated with the students and the families. And I keep coming back to we're not just educating the students. We are embracing an entire family. Sure. I mean, we go back to our historical documents as a founding of a country. It's we the people. It's not I the person. Um, you know, we're we're basically uh, all here. We're, we're we're interdependent on each other. And you know, Fairfax County Schools is uh, public schools is not any different. Um, you know, what happens in a, as as an effect on somebody in Langley, it could have an effect on somebody in you know Mount Vernon. Um, you know, it, that's. That's the type of community we live in. We have 1.3 million people, but we're all living in the same county, and we all have the same goal, which is to educate our children. And, but I, and, and I do think that if, if there's one takeaway that we can say about community schools is it's listening to the needs of the students, listening to the needs of the parents and the families, and understanding. I love how Jane Quinn said, we need to braid mm -hmm. together services. Yep. And they need to be holistic in nature, and it needs to be very specific to a particular school. Sure. If you don't get buy-in from the community, it's not going to work. And do you think, you know, going forward, and I assume that, you know, there's a lot of work to be done, first of all, in, in rolling this out, getting buy-in from the school board, from the supervisor, you know, identifying schools that might be, you know, potential pilot projects. Mm -hmm. Do you see that in the next two years or during your tenancy as president? Well, one of the things I ran on as, as, as my campaign was to bring community schools into Fairfax County. And so I'm gonna make that one of my biggest goals. Well, that's, well, and that's exactly what I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear <laughs> that this is what you came in sure. with as a goal and that you're gonna be three years? Three year term. Three year term that we can expect in the next three years that we are going to see one or more pilot projects with community schools. I'm hoping so, I, because our, our students' futures are dependent upon it. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.